All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Kelly, or as I'm known in the JB crew, Olympia Mike. Uh, today's talk is five reasons to love Nix OS. So I am curious, who are the Nix users in here and who are the Nix curious? Nix users? Okay, Nix curious? All right, this is the right crew. All right, oh, also, who's never ever gonna install Nix? <laughs> Oh, there you go. <laughs> Love it. I can't wait for the Q&A section. All right. That depends on you. Yeah, that's true. That's true. This is my job. All right. So I don't know if anyone else has been aware the last couple years there's a kind of hot buzzword. Immutable, 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 immutable. I just, it's, it's everywhere, isn't it, right? Uh, it's so hot right now. Like every major distribution has some immutable version these days. And of course, then there's ones that have sprung up that are immutable first. But what the heck is an immutable system? So if we kind of look at how traditional operating system works, and again, this is, we're using broad strokes here, but it's basically your whole system is a collection of packages, right? And it is the package manager's job to go ahead and sort out dependencies and, all right, you want to add this, you also need this, you're going to remove this, you do this. And as anyone knows that plays Jenga, you mess with those blocks enough, sometimes, you know, they come crashing down. Um, but yeah, the user can um, edit anything in here, they can remove whatever block. There's that meme where it's like, go ahead, do whatever you want. You can go ahead, remove whatever you want. You can shoot yourself in the foot. That's all totally okay in a traditional operating system. An immutable system works a little bit differently. So how it works is the whole core system is kind of treated as one big block on the bottom. And that's everything you need to get it up and running. And you can't touch it. You can't edit it. You can't mess with it. Um, if an update comes down, what they do is they slide out that big block on the bottom. They slide the new one back in. And what's on top are your files, flat packs, containers, whatever you want on there. But those blocks can't mess with that core block. That's kind of the key, the key component here. So why is that good, right? Like, why do we want to do that? Why, it seems the first time I heard about immutable systems, I'm like, ah, oh, why would you want to do that? Well, it turns out there's all kinds of good benefits there. Uh, one, enhanced security. So without being able to kind of mess with that core thing, there's a whole you know, slew of vulnerabilities that you just don't have anymore. My favorite, system stability. Um, Again, because you know you always have a good base to boot from, uh, you're, just, you're, you're just never going to get stuck. Uh, simplified management, I mean, this is why uh, Chromebooks are immutable. They are built on an immutable system, and schools love them. Why? Because they're so easy to manage, right? And you can just power wash it, and then you're, you know, back off. Reliable, predictable performance. So, again, because you're building that base image, you know what's in there, you know what's not in there, so you know how it's going to work. Uh, and then easy upgrades and rollbacks. So updates, everyone hates a distro uh, upgrade, right? Everyone hates going from like 2305 to, you know, whatever. Um, and then rolling back can be extra painful as well. And with the immutable system, we don't really have that. So yes, yeah, so if this sounds familiar, you probably are already using an immutable operating system on your phone or Chromebook. So. You know, this is why like your Apple iPhone or your Android, the update is so massive because what it's doing is it's downloading this big chunk, swapping out your old one, putting in the new one, and then off you go. Um, and it's also why you just never see, you never see an Android or uh, an iPhone or something that is in a broken state because of some application that you install. Sure, you can, you can physically break them, but they don't typically crash because, oh, I did an update and it went sideways and now I'm in, in a bad way. So, that sounds good, right? So why don't we just all use this, right? Why, don't, why, why isn't every operating system built like this? Well, there's some drawbacks to this immutable system. So, the big, big thing is, it's the, the dirty secret no one talks about, is that a use case of a phone or a Chromebook is much, much different than the use case of a Linux desktop, right? Um, I know I, I'm a developer myself, so I want to run things like MySQL and, you know, maybe Docker Compose or, you know, PHP or any of those other things, right? And I need, I really want them in my core system. So nobody's running, you know, servers on their, on their Chromebooks or their Android phones or something like that. So the use case is very different. Now, I gave my dad like a, 
Fedora Silver Blue uh, laptop, and it's great because all he needs is that core system, throw a couple flat packs on top, and he's good to go. But what about the rest of us who really want to get in there? And this is where people typically don't like immutable systems. They try something like Silver Blue or something, and they're like, ah, oh, so frustrating. It's so limiting. I can't customize it. I can't install what I want. And the answer to that typically is like, well, go into containers. So it's containers all the way down. Um, I like containers just fine, but I don't want to be in them day in and day out just constantly. And so what it ends up feeling like to me, this is this image I put up here. If anyone's had a grandmother or aunt that had a couch covered in plastic, the plastic keeps the couch safe, yeah, but nobody wants to sit on that couch. So what's the point, right? So NixOS has a very clever way around this. Uh, and so what they do, and, and NixOS has been around for, I think, 20 years, right? And someone someone uh, knew that. So yeah, it's been around for like about 20 years, and it turns out they kind of had this interesting approach the whole way along. And what they do is, it's still the same type of thing, right? Where it's like, okay, you have this core base that you can't mess with, um, and your files and containers and flat packs and stuff are on top, but you get to decide what's in here. So you get to decide what's in that base image. So if you want Docker in there, go for it. If you want uh, MySQL, PHP, VS Code, whatever you want, you can put that in the base image. Um, and then the pieces that it uses to build that base image stick around, the, all the versions of that, which will come in handy in a little bit here. So before we go into it, I kind of want to give you a little background uh, for me. Who, who has a 90s picture like this? I mean, look at that. I would kind of kill for that keyboard again, though, I'm just saying. So, you know, I think it's important to kind of think about like how people, like how I got to my story with Linux and, and, and NixOS. So yeah, I grew up in the 80s and 90s. I tinkered around with Linux. Remember, anyone remember NDIS wrapper for those little Wi-Fi cards that you had to put in? You had to be there. Awful. My first big win with Linux is I was working at a tech company and we had like, it was right before it was 2006, 2007. There's all these crappy mortgage companies that were popping up all over the place, which we know what happened there. And, uh, but they all had like 20, 30 computers and they all wanted to share like a central drive, like a Z drive. And in Windows, if you tried to share a folder with more than 10 computers, they made you upgrade the server. And so what I did is I started deploying Ubuntu 6.06 .06 boxes with Samba sharing and it was fantastic. And so that was my first big win with Linux in general. And this is, again, going back the brown Ubuntu, you know, back in the day. And, uh, but I still always just kept it on the server. I never used Linux on the desktop. Then was my Mac phase. I remember I got one of these things for like 20 bucks on a, on a deal, fixed it up. And I was just sold on the whole Mac OS thing for a long time. So yeah, so like the next 13 years, I was just all Mac. Nobody could tell me otherwise. During that time, 2016, um, my wife and I kind of accidentally developed this product called Member Vault. And so it's a SaaS product. It's our full-time business right now. Uh, yeah, it's a, it, it's, it's a great business. And, uh, and I'm still doing that to this day. And during this time, the stability of my machine was so important. I'm still running, you know, at this point, I'm running Linux servers in the cloud and everything, but I'm still using a Mac for my personal computer. Um, and I just realized with every Mac OS update, it's getting a little bit further from why I loved Mac OS in the first place. So, then things start slipping. I, I, I love it. I, I went back and I found this. So March 13, 2020, uh, I had to send my stupid 2019 MacBook Pro with the best keyboard in the world, heavy sarcasm, uh, back to Apple. And I was like, I can't be without a computer. So I ended up buying this crappy $250 Walmart Ryzen 3 machine, threw Linux Mint on it, and used that while my machine was at Apple. So, it was, as, and it was kind of a big win. I was like, okay, all right, all right, I see you, Linux. Um, I still didn't switch, and I remember I bought a Mac Mini, an Intel Mac Mini. And then in June 2020, uh, Big Sur came out, and when that downloaded, it just trashed my local dev environment. I spent two days, uh, homebrew wasn't working right and everything like that, so, it was bad, it was bad. I was so, so frustrated. I kind of rage quit, um, rage quit Apple then. Uh, actually, the, my fix for it ended up being I put Pop! OS on my Intel Mac 
Mini. And after two days of struggling and fighting Mac OS and 20 minutes with Pop OS, I literally had my whole thing up and running. At the time, it was just PHP MySQL, PHP MySQL, Apache, you know, the old LAMP stack. Uh, and again, it just ran right out of the box there. So that was it. I was sold. And uh, yeah, so I switched to full-time uh, Linux. I remember I, this is how I discovered Linux Unplugged during this time. And it kind of convinced me, like, okay, I can do this. And my first full-time Linux machine was System76 uh, System Lemur Pro when they first came out. Yeah, we got one right up front. Showing signs of wear, too. That's well loved. <laughs> so now I'm on Linux. Problem solved, right? Ha, 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 who knows this? Uh, then came the distro hopping. And this was, I still remember my wife catching me in my office in the middle of the night. She's like, what are you doing in here? And I just had flash drives in my hands. I was like, <laughs> please help me. <laughs> she thought I was up to like no good. And I'm just flashing ISO. It was like crazy. Um, I, tried, I tried every single distro, right? I love them all, right? I wanted to, I'm like, oh, I like Lynx Mint because of this. I like Arch because of this. And I fell down all the rabbit holes. And I kind of always switched between like Pop, Mint, Arch, Fedora, you know, and, uh, and of course, every time you switch, you, you nuke and pave and you got to start all over and I got really good at setting stuff up. Um, but yeah, and it was, but I, I was never settled, you know, I never stayed married to anything. And then ah, I looked this up too. So in March of 2022, so two years ago is when Linux Unplugged did their, their NixOS challenge. And at first I was like, oh, I don't need this. Like I got enough distros to deal with. I don't want to deal with another one. But then I started using it and I was like, oh, okay, I see. And it brings me to my top five reasons I love NixOS. And, and you might too, right? So these are the five things that Alex was asking. He's like, how did you narrow it down to five? And that was a hard thing to do, but these are my top, top five. So I'm gonna go through them one at a time. Um, basically desktop hopping, I think is better than distro hopping for a number of reasons. Um, stable and rolling, why not both? Being able to self-document your system, uh, Nick shell and generation. So here, let's get into it. So, so often, I don't know about you, but I often distro hop because I want to try different desktops. Not that I much care about the different, you know, uh, distros particularly, like if you're running Linux Mint, it's mostly because, well, you like cinnamon. If you're running Fedora, maybe you like that vanilla GNOME experience, right? KDE, Neon, right? Like that's, these are the reasons that a lot of people distro hop. And what I always loved about Arch was that you can install whatever desktop that you want. But anyone who's gone on to Arch and been like, I'm on GNOME, I'm gonna switch to KDE, knows that that isn't as easy as it sounds. So it's hard to switch. You kind of have to pick. I ended up nuking and paving every time I switched desktop environments, even on Arch. Um, Nix OS, this is not a problem, and I'll show you, I'll show you why. This is great. So Nix uh, offers like, and, and what I like about Nix is it's very Arch-like as far as it's very minimal. It's very unopinionated, minimal versions of your desktop. So you get the vanilla experience. They put a Nix OS wallpaper on there, and that's it. That's the only Nix thing that's in there. So it's not like Manjaro where like it themes it all green and stuff like that. It doesn't do any of that kind of stuff. It throws a wallpaper up there. It gives you... Uh, a core collection of good applications that you'd want with that. And you can, in the config, exclude them too. I'm not going to get into that here. Um, but yes, and then also, you know, when you're switching between uh, desktop environments, uh, you really want that stability, and that's where, like, Arch had bitten me in the past. Um, so yeah, and NixOS makes this uh, desktop, you know, desktop switching really, really clean. So I, I did this in literally 10 minutes. I threw up a VM, put Nix on it. This is GNOME. This is, like, the default GNOME experience, which is your standard vanilla GNOME. Literally, I changed one line in my config, went back, rebuilt it, rebooted. This is the same machine, five minutes later, in Plasma 6, I think. Yeah. yeah. Here we are in Cinnamon. Again, same system, same application, same files, just switched over. And you notice there's not any like weird KDE programs that like got left behind. Um, when you switch, it's like the old one was never there. And I think that's the really, really amazing thing about how um, Nix does this because when it rebuilds that base image, it just rebuilds it without the things that you don't include. So you don't, it's not that you're removing, it's hard to remove, you know, there's that dependency hell. Like, okay, I'm going to remove GNOME and I'm going to install KDE. Well, inevitably, there's some GNOME programs that get left behind and then they feel really out of place with, with KDE or something. Um, 
Oh, I threw another one up there. Yeah, budgie, why not? Budgie too, why not, right? And this, is, this makes my distro hopping heart happy because I do like to tinker around. Sometimes it's a Saturday, I'm like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna have a beer and I'm gonna check out the new budgie, you know? Um, but you can do that safely without nuking your whole computer. That's pretty cool. Number two thing I love about NextOS is stable and rolling. You can have both and you can literally switch between them at will, which sounds crazy, but it's true. So, you know, another reason that people will pick a distribution or hop around is because they want, maybe they, they want a rolling release. Maybe they want that cutting edge stuff, right? I want to be an arch because I want all the new stuff, right? Um, but then arch bites you and then you're like, oh, the hell with arch, man. I'm going LTS. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna play it cool and be LTS and you nuke and pave again. So a lot of times people are choosing a distribution because they want fresh packages or they want to be a little more conservative and be on a more LTS release cycle. Well, using NixOS channels, you have both. So your core NixOS config tells the computer what you want to build, but it doesn't specify versions of anything. It just tells you what it wants, you know, the blueprint. And then the NixOS channel that you go to will determine what versions of those things that you get. And because NixOS is always when you rebuild, you're always getting a fresh image, well, it's okay. You, there's no dependency hell or anything like that. So you can be on an LTS and be like, ah, it's getting a little stale. I kind of want the new whatever. You can switch to rolling and you basically have just made your Ubuntu box an arch box and rebooted it and voila, and everything's there. Everything's fine. Uh, and then if the rolling release bites you, they call it unstable. They call it unstable for a reason. And sometimes it is unstable. And if that happens, you roll back to LTS, you roll back to the, to the stable release and rebuild and you're good again. And you've never lost anything. So switching between the two is easy. So here's Helix, my new favorite text editor. You can see if you go to NixOS packages, uh, you can actually see what versions of these things that you're gonna get. So um, there's a little toggle up at the top. So at the time of doing this, it was 23.11 and unstable. So you can see version 23.10 of Helix uh, on the stable channel and version 24.03 on, on that. Again, switching between, I said it was really easy to switch. I'm gonna actually show the code on how to do that uh, because it is quite easy. So in this first thing here, I'm saying, hey, show me my channels, right? And so there I am on the 23, ooh, it works. The 23.11 uh, channel there. And then I say, okay, well, go ahead and switch it. Add the unstable branch to that, you know, NixOS channel. And then voila, I'm on unstable. And all I have to do is NixOS rebuild, boot, reboot, and voila, everything, everything <coughs> is on that um, rolling channel now. So it's very, very cool. What about the kernel? Well, the kernel is kind of cool because you can actually switch that independent of your channel. So yes, your channel is like what packages that you get and stuff like that, uh, what versions of those. But you can also, in your NixOS config, so this is in my, you know, my little config file here, and I have it commented out. I just stay on an LTS kernel. But let's say I'm on a machine where it's kind of new hardware and I want, that, I want that freshest kernel. Well, you can get that. And you can actually be on a stable release channel, but get the brand new you know, uh, kernel. Or you can be on a bleeding edge you know, release. You can be on the unstable channel, but maybe you want that LTS kernel. Maybe the new kernel is messing with you for some reason. You can mix and match them, which is pretty cool. All right, number three, self-documenting system. This is one of my favorite things about Nix, right? Um, I don't know, people that distro hop, you end up leaving yourself notes places. And I remember I had, I had a GitHub uh, project that was just full of shell scripts for like notes I was leaving myself, basically. Um, but you gotta remember to do that. But what's nice about Nix is that you actually have to put it in the config file before you can use it. So it kind of forces you to write documentation, which then you can go ahead and use. And what I do is I start leaving myself uh, some notes in there too. So um, yeah, I'm gonna show you some of my stuff as well here. So what I do in, in Nix, this is kind of, I call it like poor man's flakes. I'm not getting into flakes or home manager or anything like that. This is really trying to keep this overview here. Uh, and you can put everything in your, you know, uh, Etsy, NixOS, configuration.nix, whatever's in that file, gets built and gets put into your next. But what I do is I break up my next into packages, you know, separation of concerns kind of thing. So I make myself like little chunks of config 
and I have those in my, uh, in my GitHub. And if anybody wants to check them out, they are public. You can go ahead, um, GitHub mkleXP slash nix. You can go ahead and you can see all the stuff that I have in here. And it's cool. So like this is my system Nix. So like, no matter what system I have, uh, I include this one, right? So this has stuff like my audio, right? And a lot of this is generated for me when I first install it, but I just kind of break it up. Um, I have garbage collection set automatic, so I don't have these old stuff, you know, old packages laying around. Um, and then you see, I leave myself some notes. <laughs> and it's such a good place to leave yourself some notes because then you, you're never without, because you might go uh, a year or two, uh, and then you buy a new computer and you set it up and you're like, oh, right, crap, what do I need to do for that? Um, you can put all that right in there. So, like, here's my applications. You can list, you can, well, you can kind of see what I do, right? Um, and you can see all the packages that are installed in there. I can't even tell you how nice it is. So this laptop, I switched to this two days ago from my main ThinkPad because the battery life of my ThinkPad was killing me. What kind of maniac switches his laptop two days before giving a talk? But I didn't care. I knew that I was going to be fine because when I include all this stuff and I rebuild, it took me 20, 30 minutes to get completely set up on this new laptop um, with all my stuff there, all my applications. It's not like I go to like you know, uh, run Helix, I'm like, oh crap, I don't have Helix installed, right? But of course I do, because it's all right here. And again, you can go ahead and you can leave yourself notes in there as well. Um, I'm a developer, like I said, uh, this is great. I, I used to use NixOS and Docker together, which works fine, you can do that. But then I took the time and I put it in my uh, Nix config. So now I'm running my whole uh, Nginx, PHP, MySQL stack all inside of Nix. And boy, not only is it faster, but it's a lot easier when I get a new system. I don't have to manually install and set all this stuff up or wait, you know, have Docker Compose go and doing its thing. So I have all this stuff there. You can see I have my local, you know, my local sites that I, because you can't edit the Etsy host file. It's read only, because remember, you can't touch it. But again, you have it in there. And that actually makes it way, way, way better. Um, again, notes in there, bada bing. And these are the different desktop environments. So this is, when I was talking about switching, switching desktop environments, you know, I have a .nix file for each desktop environment for like things I like in each one, right? Uh, and I can switch between them. And it's just, it's really, really cool to have that kind of stuff in there. So as you can see, what would it take for me to switch this laptop right here from GNOME to Plasma 6? I literally would have to just change GNOME to KDE. Rebuild, reboot, I'm on Plasma 6 with all my applications, with all my services, with all my stuff, all there. It's the best of distro hopping without the pain of distro hopping. Okay, number four, this is a good one. Nick Shell, I love Nick Shell. Nick Shell is such a handy, handy little tool. So this, I mean, this is my kid's room basically. Um, but if anybody knows the feeling of, you go down a rabbit hole and you're like, oh, all right, I'm gonna do this little side project thing, right? And then you start installing something. And then, oh, I need this thing to unzip this thing. Or, oh, I need to install Python to compile this, right? Before you know it, you've installed like about 100 packages in your system. That like, good luck remembering all that stuff and then removing them later. This is how the cruft builds up in your system. You do these little side project things and then it you know, just gums up your whole system. So, Nick Shell is very, very, very handy and clever. What it does is it temporarily downloads these things that you can use within the scope of your project, or you know, in the scope of your, your system. So it's not a container, it's not a VM, it's an environment, but you can still interact with all your files. I'm gonna show you a real world example here. And then when you exit Nix Shell, it's gone. It just doesn't exist anymore. It was just temporary. So, very handy. But what the work that you did in there stays around. So here's a real world example. Uh, my kids have these little audio players, they're called Yodos, very cool. Uh, it reads them audio books. Um, and they have a, you can make your own cards or whatever, and they have like this online service. But of course I need MP3 files. I need, you know, something there. But I have an Audible account. I wanna use my Audible credits. So it turns out there's a tool to um, convert Audible files to MP3 files. You can jailbreak them essentially. And they're all inside Nix, right? So there's the Audible CLI, there's a tool called IAX to MP3, and then FFmpeg if you need to break big chapters into smaller ones or something like that, right? So I can literally just type Nick shell, dash P, those things. Notice I didn't even have to do sudo. I'd just be in as, a, as that user. And what it's gonna do 
is it's going to drop me into, you see that says Nick's shell now. So now I'm in a little environment where I have access to all these programs that I just installed. Um, and then I can go ahead and I can do it, right? So here's my run, my run command, and so there's my AX file. And it's going to go ahead and light up all my cores and, uh, and do that. But here's what's cool. This is what I think is really cool. You're not, you don't have to export it from that container or something like that. Um, everything that you've done in Nick Shell sticks around, but the programs are gone. So if I go ahead, so, so here I'm still in Nick Shell, right? And here's all the MP3 files that, it, that, it, that ripped out from that Audible file, right? Um, and then I go ahead, cool, exit. So now you see, instead of Nick Shell, now it says M. Kelly, right? So now I'm back out. So I no longer, I'm not in that shell. But look, all those files that I did, all the work that I did while in that shell is still there. That's super handy. <laughs> so I get to like, so you need to like unzip something or like if you need to compile something, you need to install something just temporarily, but you still want the finished product, right? This is what it does. So, and you can see too, right? So even though I have all those files, I go ahead and I type, you know, this AX to MP3 and it's like, dog, you don't even have it installed. <laughs> so it's very, very handy. I like it. All right. Number five, my, it's the last one. We're at the end already. All right, so this is cool. I'm bad at backups. I'm bad at snapshots. I've never, never been very good at it. Um, I still back up data and everything too, but you know, everybody needs to have a, a way. Uh, what I would do is I would just get really good at reinstalling an OS from scratch than rather do, than doing snapshots, even though I knew better. Um, but uh, what the thing I hate about snapshots is that you can lose data. It, how old is that snapshot? What's in that snapshot, right? Like, oh, I, I know I've rolled back the snapshots that I thought were pretty recent and then realized, oh, there's a whole bunch of work that's gone now because it wasn't in that snapshot. Like, oh, bloody hell. So generations um, are much, I think, more clever way of, of dealing with it. So, I'm gonna talk about that. All right. so you remember I was talking about how when you build that NixOS base image, it keeps the old versions of that around. So let's say it's like Helix 23.10, uh, and then you do an update or whatever, and it downloads Helix 25.2 or whatever. The, 20, the old one is still in your Nix store. It's still on your system. It's just not linked anymore, right? Um, so when you type Helix, right, you get the new version. Well, if you roll back to a previous generation, it just links to the old one because that old package is still around. So you can always boot back to a working config. But all the files, all the little files that you put on top, all those things are the same. Same thing with flat packs, like it doesn't touch user space. So I guess that's it, right? It's rollbacks without messing with user space at all. So here's an example. I did something, let's pretend I was on Cinnamon, right? And I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna check out Budgie, right? I switched to Budgie and I create a file on my desktop. And then I start working. And then I realize, oh man, I don't like Budgie, it doesn't do these things, right? I, and, but I gotta hop on a call. I gotta call in like five minutes. I can't, I can't mess around with this, right? So let me go back to Cinnamon. Let me roll back. Well, you reboot, right? And now here's your NixOS configurations, your generations. Every time you do an update, every time you do a rebuild, you get an entry in here automatically. You don't have to set this up. And then I go, hey, let me roll back to my last known configuration, which I know was Cinnamon, right? Now, what would happen normally if this was a snapshot? If this was a snapshot, that file I created on my desktop would be gone, wouldn't it? Because I'm like, oh, I rolled back to the previous thing. Well, not next. Because what it did is it went ahead and rebuilt my system, you know, linked all those other things that, I, that, you know, the cinnamon and everything. And it just booted right up and I didn't lose any work. So that's what's nice about this is that like it uses those old uh, packages. And this is one of the criticisms of <laughs> NixOS is that it uses a lot of storage and it can. But this is why. <laughs> because it has, um, it's an insurance policy, right? And that's where garbage collection comes in. That's a further topic. Uh, I think Wes is talking after me. He'll probably talk about that kind of stuff too. Um, but yeah, you, you can see that like it gives you confidence. I, I've done updates right before calls. I've done updates right before big server upgrades or whatever. Like I used to fear that stuff. Like, oh my God, don't touch the computer. Like I'm, I'm going to doing this big thing. Um, but with NixOS, you just don't really have to worry about that. Um, generations, I think, are a really, really clever, clever way to, to do that. So, in the end, uh, I've been on NixOS for two years straight now, and I haven't distro hopped once. 
and like this is how it makes me feel with my computer, right? So that's a little corny, but yeah. <laughs> so anyway, here's my. Uh, if you guys are curious to follow me uh, on Weapon X, Twitter, whatever, uh, that Fediverse, and then that is uh, my company. So any questions? Next to last, there was a lot of next curious people. Okay. Just curious, two years into it. Yeah. Has NixOS and its infrastructure ever failed? I had one time where I rebooted and it didn't work, and I was like, oh no, is this it? Has Nix failed me? But I went back, and here I disabled X11. So, <laughs> whoops, I, uncom I commented out the wrong line. But because I could roll back, I just uncommented that line again. And that I was in your YAML file or your NixOS. Yeah, in, in my config file. So that was it literally hasn't caused an issue since. And unstable has been actually very stable for me too, except for one time there was an issue where like, I think the fonts got jacked up or something like that on unstable. And like my, everything looked weird. But again, all I did was switch my channel to stable, rebuild and- I, I certainly wasn't blaming- Yeah, no, no, no. I was wondering whether Nick's infrastructure itself- Yeah, oh, the, the Nix, yeah. No, I, I haven't had any problems. So, yeah, for two years now, I've been, this is how I've been rolling. And again, I, I, I'll also admit that I don't use Flakes. I'm not using Home Manager. I keep things pretty simple. So it's just real basic. And that's why when I said I break my config out into multiple little .next files, uh, which is on my GitHub there, um, that's part of the reason I do that, right? Because I just, just keep it simple, right? That's, that's what I do. You gave the example of rolling back to a previous version. Yeah. It's rolling back to that. Um, earlier config, right? So any, right. any other edits that you had, you would lose that, correct? Edits to what? Uh, to your config. To your config, yes, yes. Okay. So yeah, it's like basically a snapshot of your config. Um, but, but my point uh, that I was really excited about was the fact that it doesn't mess with your files or any flat packs that you updated or something like that. It doesn't mess with stuff in user space. Um, it's just rebuilding that can, config again. And again, it can be helpful, like even if like, in my case where I just talked about where I accidentally uh, commented out X11 and I couldn't log back in. I was like, uh-oh. Um, it was nice to be able to go back and like, look and be like, oh, okay, ah, that's stupid me. And then I can go ahead and you know, change, that, change that file as, as needed. So there's a little bit of extra time that you have to monkey around with your, your config to get it right. But then once it's right, you're, you're gold. <laughs> you know? It hasn't, hasn't bit any sense. There was something over here? Yeah. Um, so when you have to rebuild a package, like you're going from one desktop environment to the next, yeah. um, is, it, is it having to basically just slot that out of that base, basically put in the new KDE one, and it only has to rebuild KDE, or is it redoing everything to package it up before that, that first boot? Yeah, no, good question. Um, so again, it knows, like when you do a rebuild, right, um, it knows it's not having to pull down all the other packages. If you're just swapping out GNOME for, for KDE, Remember I talked about that Nix store, how it keeps the versions of it? So there's something called slash Nix store, which is heavier than a black hole. Uh, there's a funny gif about that. Um, but all the pieces that you need, you can think of it like a Lego bin, right? All the Legos are in there. And so if you pull down a new package that has never been pulled down before, a new version of it, it gets added to the Lego bin. And then when you rebuild, it sorts through the Lego bin and it snaps it together and then voila, build your image. So if you go ahead and you switch from you know, the KDE or something like that, it'll pull down the KDE packages, but all the other packages that you had are still in the Lego bin. So it's just gonna put them together just like that. Thank you. Okay, of course. I have two. Yeah. Um, had you tried Nick Darwin before you switched to Nix OS? What is it? Nick Darwin? No. Like it's a uh, it's Nix for Mac. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah, cool. It's not uh, no, I had not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's mostly it's mostly just the package manager, but okay. It's uh, and then the NixOS question was, um, you said you can follow different channels, like yeah. stable and unstable. Can you overwrite that for very specific things? Like, can I do mostly 23.11, but I really want this updated package? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, I didn't get into that, because again, I don't, <laughs> here's the thing, you can go pretty deep down, down the Nix hole, uh, and I didn't want to do that. But you see how, where is it? Okay, so you see how right here I said, See, I'm adding the channel, I'm adding this channel, and I'm calling it NixOS. And that's that NixOS there. So that's overwriting it. But you uh, could, you can add it as like, oh, here's my NixOS unstable, right? And then there's a way in your config to call out, hey, I want the new Helix, but leave my rest of, you know, leave the rest of my system um, on, on stable. Okay. So yes, you can. And so you uh, would refer to it as like, 
uh, MixOS dash unstable in your config after it's added to your channels like that? Yeah, so yeah. Add the channel in your config also. Yeah, and again, I, I actually haven't done this, but I do oh, know okay. it's possible. Um, there's a, it, you can do it without yep. the channels. Okay. You can just add it to your configuration, like import this MixOS unstable, and then you usually do like mix.unstable dot and then the package name that you want this package from unstable because I did that for Proton VPN when they had it broken and stable. Okay. And then unstable had a fix, so I was mainly pulling that unstable package to get that fixed until they pulled it. Okay. So yep. you Thanks. can do it. Lakes, it's a little bit more difficult, but with traditional configuration, it's easier. Okay. Okay. Where's the line between user space and config? Like, are your dot .files config or file? Yeah, anything in your, in, in your home directory is, is, is fair game. And in fact, that's the one place where things can get mucky, is like if you have like a lot of dot .files, they don't get purged in between each time. Now, someone's gonna say, hey, home manager will fix that, and you're, they're probably right. Um, I haven't done that. So yeah, if, if I do need, like I've had a system for, again, two years just running, and I've hopped around a million different places. And like my dot files got have been get you know got a little messy, and so what I do is like my Nix format is I just delete my dot config directory and then like start over, <laughs> you know. Um, so yeah, but it doesn't touch those things, um, and that's actually one of the things that I do all the time because like there's configurations I like for Helix and stuff like that, and so what I'll do is I'll symlink the Helix, you know, config into my uh, into my config, and that never gets messed with. So in between in between rebuilds. So yeah, a, 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 anything in your, you know, tilde home is 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 safe, doesn't get messed with. And again, there's Etsy, you know, Etsy NixOS. Like obviously you can edit that because that's where your config file is. Um, and again, and there, I know uh, I also because uh, I'm running uh, nginx and PHP. Like I actually write my files to slash bar slash dub 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 because that's where Nix, you know, that's where um, nginx wants to see them. And and I can dump those files there too. But again, the the you know the rest of the system is pretty immutable. You can't you can't mess with it. I can't like for instance my host files, right? Like so if I'm like oh I want course.local to just point to you know to one two seven zero zero one, you can't edit your host file. That needs to be in the config, um, which ends up being it, it pissed me off the first time. I was like, Come on, I can't edit my host file. Um, now I'm like oh I kind of like it in the config. Now <laughs> now I never need to worry about it again. Um, actually, it, it was on my ATC hosts question. It's, you know, sometimes when you just kind of need to put a host in there quickly while you're doing something, and then you might want to remove it. Can you go into like Nix shell and then temporarily edit it for that, and then lose it after a reboot? Oh, uh, edit it what? Uh, Using Nix shell. Wait, Nix shell to edit your config? Yeah. Say you wanted to edit ATC hosts just temporarily, because sometimes you just need to stick a host in it yeah. uh, to override something. It, it, to make it sort of a temporary update, can you do that from the next shower? Or is it just completely I'm not sure. Um, I'm going to be honest. I'm, I, I'm not sure. And again, what's nice too is that um, I showed, yeah, see here I showed uh, NixOS rebuild boot, right? And what that means is rebuild that image, but don't apply them until I reboot, right? And that's nice because especially if you're switching desktop environments, you don't want to hot swap that. Like you, you'll end up in some weird broken state. Um, but replace boot with switch. Right, next to us, rebuild switch, and then it's whatever you apply to the config is live. So you don't have to wait for a reboot. So in your case, right, even if you did have to temporarily edit your config to say, oh, I just temporarily want, you know, whatever, bananas.dev to point local. Uh, you can go ahead and add that and type next to us, rebuild switch, and it'll do it. Um, so you don't have to reboot, you know what I mean? It's not that, you know. Big of a deal, but you there might be a way to do it in in Nix shell or something temporarily, because I know there's also some kind of like Nix environments, uh, which that might do it. I, I don't know. This again, the rabbit hole of Nix goes pretty deep. Does that? That's, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, Alex. It's not, it's not a question. It's a, a sort of pseudo answer. All Nix shell is doing is modifying the symlink tree temporarily whilst you're in that context, it's like a true root almost. And then, so you add that symlink for the, the packages you add, and then suddenly you have access to those applications. Oh, yeah. it won't touch hosts <laughs> file though. You can probably edit it, or you can try and edit it, and it'll say read only file. So then you do what Mike said and do the switch temporarily. And the switch is pretty instant. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Instant, yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. More eloquently said, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Is hosting your configs on GitHub like the, the recommended 
plus way to, you know, it's just what you do. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people do, um, you know, as far as like what service to do it on. Obviously, you don't put any keys or anything like that, you know what I mean? Don't put any secrets in there, uh, which you wouldn't do anyway. Um, so yeah, there's nothing, nothing private or, you know, uh, you know, exposing in there. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a, a lot of people will have their, their Nix configs um, on, on GitHub. I just want them, because what I do, when I install NixOS on a brand new machine, uh, I use the GUI editor. And you know, gets you into GNOME. There's a KDE version too. Um, and what I do is, when I step through, I actually choose minimal install, like just the CLI. Uh, and then in the CLI, you have access to uh, Network Manager. So I just do you know NMTY, connect to my Wi-Fi, and I nick shell in um, Helix because I'm not going to use now, and um, and Git, and I just Git clone my stuff, include those files, rebuild, and I'm off. So. Yeah, that's what's that's what's that's why I keep those there because I'm like ah, I just want it in one place. Also, I have this is it didn't make it on the slides, but one another favorite thing that I have is I synchronize a lot of machines. So I'm a dad of three. I have computers and little workstations everywhere. I have one in the garage. I got one in my co-working office, and I have a laptop when I need to run away from my house, um, which happens occasionally. And what's nice is that because my configs are in Git. I can keep all three of those computers synchronized. So like, let's say I add something, you know, oh, hey, there's this new tool I want to use, right? If I add it to my config, what I do is I have a dot .update, um, like an update.shell script that first git pulls my Nix folder and then rebuilds. So within one update, all my, all my computers are synchronized. So like the same stuff is on all my computers. Um, so that's pretty good. Yeah, in fact. Uh, does Nix have its own language? I mean, like, all its own syntax, or is it something called Bash? Yeah, I don't know. Alex, what is it? Is it Nix? Is it YAML? Is it? Well, Nix is a package manager. Yeah. Nix is an OS, and Nix is also a language. Yeah. An expression language. Uh, right. So it's, kind of, it's kind of annoying, but it's its own <laughs> thing. It's, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, the, it's the curly brace language. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's the technical answer. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there is there is syntax um, that, and it'll yell at you, obviously, if you get it wrong. Um, I, I don't know it, right? The, the, the NixOS um, um, documentation is actually fairly good. If, if you're looking up something specific, um, for instance, like I, I wanted to do like TLP, like battery frequency, you know, stuff, it's really easy. Or like if you have an NVIDIA, um, you know, there's an, on the next week wiki, there's like an, a whole page for like, NVIDIA, and they just kind of give you, all right, put this brick in your config, and you're off to the races. So, yeah, you kind of learn it. Um, and again, you can kind of wrap it to, like, services.pipewire equals, and then all this stuff. I could do services.pipewire dot enable, and then that whole thing again, dot also enable. Like, you can be long-winded about it, or you can kind of, you know, wrap it, wrap it in braces, but you don't have to if it's easier for you to read you know, line by line, you can do that as well. So, yeah, it's it works. Does anyone else? Oh, yeah. Uh, does Nix have any support for like specific hardware type things and things? Where is it? Ah. I guess you pull it. You see this hardware configuration? Yeah, like when you first install. And actually, this is one of the reasons um, that I purposely break up when I first started using Nix. I put my whole config in this, in this one file. Right? Put the whole config in that file, um, and I check that into GitHub. But the only problem is that this does have some stuff that might be specific to, to, to my machine. Um, so I don't do that anymore, and that's purposely why I kind of break up my next config into these separate things, um, so that each machine has a, you know, its unique one there. Um, and then, yeah, and then it, it, it does this hardware configuration. So when you first install it, it pulls stuff into there, and I know there's also um, I haven't played around I haven't had to play around with it too much, but there's also a Nix hardware I guess repo for like quirky quirky things like um, I think there's like a Microsoft Surface for the touch screen. There's all kinds of you know stuff in there as well, or Pinebook Pro. I remember I was messing around with it when I was trying to get it working on ARM. Um, so yeah, there 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 are hardware specific things uh, in there too. Can you show the slide with your GitHub? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, there it is. Thing. 
Aaron? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, sorry. Uh, so let's say you just installed Mix OS and you have it in front of you. Like, what do you do next? Like, how do you get started? <laughs> Well, first you have to post on Twitter that you just installed NextOS and that you're awesome now. Um, no, and then buy a shirt. Uh, no, I, I mean, get to work. I, I don't, you know. So I mean, one of the first things I do, I still use Flatpak. So you can see, you know, when I'm in here, like these, these are, and you, everyone chooses their own thing, right? Um, some people want to have all their applications, all their GUI and CLI applications in the config, and that's can be handy. But things like Telegram, Spotify, um, those types of things, I just use Flatpak. And so you can enable Flatpak in NextOS too. And so you, know, you can install those. And again, they won't carry on in the config. I think there's a project to synchronize your Flatpaks too. Like if they're, that's the one manual thing I need to do when I jump between computers. It's like, oh, there's a handful of Flatpaks. Like they're, not, you know, they're not dictated in here. Um, but uh, but yeah, and then I, I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, go ahead, mess with your GNOME settings the way you want to, stuff like that. Um, and again, even Nick Shell too, I, I used it in a very basic CLI uh, way, but you can actually Nick Shell in an entire GUI application as well. So let's say you want to try like Sublime Text or something like that, right? Sublime 4. You can literally Nick Shell Sublime 4 and then type Sublime 4 and it'll launch the GUI application. So it's actually a nice way to try out an app without even installing it too. And then you can be like, oh, I like it. All right, I'm gonna add it to my config. Or like, nope, didn't like that. You know, don't have to, don't have to live with it or uninstall it. So I don't know if that helps. Are you, are you saying like, well, you know, uh, stick around. I think Wes Payne is giving a talk on how to install NixOS next or doing some tips around that. So that might be, you know, more specific around like what to do next. That may be the, the question he asked, and that's what I was going to do, maybe Westwood. But the fundamental thing is, I have a computer here. Yeah. They've had Windows on it, and they've had, had uh, you know, I uh, had a Ubuntu on or whatever. Yeah. What are the next steps to to join the next world? Yeah. I mean, I mean, what, what, uh, I mean, how, what? There's an, there's an oath. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, this is great. so like my, my kids' computers, uh, they have they they're homeschooled and they they do some online classes and everything else. Um, my kids' computers are Nix boxes too, and again, they have the simplest version of it. So I literally do the GUI editor and I just tell it to install GNOME, like it just installs. So in the GUI editor, you can pick which. Uh, no, understand, but how do I get the GUI in there? I, mean, I don't have anything installed on this hardware. Oh, you download ISO. So there's an installer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, this is what's great. Is that, um, and I actually wrote a, a Medium article, too. I should have put it up here, too, on you know just getting started with NixOS. It really is, especially with the new GUI editor, uh, the GUI installers. It installs just like any other distro. If you've installed Ubuntu or sure. Mint or anything, it's going to be the same. You just choose you know what uh, partitions you want and everything. You go through the whole setup. And then, but then you actually get to pick which desktop environment you want. Like, all right, you want Plasma, you want GNOME, you want, you can, or again, what I do is just no desktop and then I pipe in my own because you nerd like that, but you don't have to. Uh, and like I said, for my kids, I just, I have NixOS on a thumb drive always. And um, yeah, I got their computer, booted to it, installed GNOME, enabled Flatpak, installed the Zoom and Chrome or whatever they need for their classes, and that's it. They're done. So. You know, nothing more needed there. <laughs> they have the they have the simplest thing. I, I also gave my dad NixOS too, um, which is fantastic because he's broken every single computer I've ever given him, and he has not broken Nix yet. So that's that's a testament. There's still time. Yeah, I mean, I don't. <laughs> you didn't challenge him or anything. Yeah, uh, that's all right. actually, for, for that example, how if you're giving it to somebody else, how do you? How do they do updates? Is it automatic? Do they have to issue a command? Yeah, and this is where things, this is why I don't still recommend uh, NixOS to like, beginners, <laughs> you know? I, I don't think that there is, uh, you can enable automatic updates, but the problem is it's not gonna automatically switch channels. So when the new channel comes out, right? So like I'm on 23.11 here, but any day now we're gonna get you know 24.05, um, and 
I have to manually switch that channel over to there. So to my knowledge, there is no automatic way to do that. And I think that's, you know, there, there's no GUI updater or anything like that. Obviously your flat pack, so like if you enable flat pack and you're using GNOME, um, when you go into software, it updates your flat packs. You know, like that interface is the same. Um, but then you're just updating flat packs. And so that's like when I give my dad, like I stick around, right? So every six months or something, I'll go ahead and when I'm over his house, I'll just change his channel and update it and it's fine. Uh, but he can update his own flat packs and he can install his own flat packs uh, just through the GUI, you know, thing. But there is no GUI updater that I know of. There might be a project that does it. And again, you can enable automatic updates, but they, they kind of, they happen all the time. I actually think they happen too frequently and then it blows up your next generations. Like, cause you go to reboot and you're like, why, why are there a hundred generations in here? And it's cause the automatic update is just like constantly doing those. Um, and again, you don't want to put somebody, if you're giving it to somebody, you don't really want to put them on unstable. So eh, that, that, that isn't sorted out yet. But it does, uh, in between the six month period when you're visiting your dad, does it do security updates? Well, yes, if you update. So, uh, where? only updating once every six months. Yeah, he's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah if, there, if, there is a, if there is a big one. Um, I mean, once every six months is all I have to do. I was trying to see. Okay, yeah, and so uh, NixOS rebuild um, dash dash upgrade will upgrade your packages and you'll get security updates. It's not like, it's not like the stable channel like locks you into like every single version. So any kind of security updates or something like that will, will come down as well. So you haven't run that in between times? I don't, but you know, or, or I just put it on his dashboard, you know, on his uh, desktop, there's like a little, you know, script that he can just click on. Um, he's not moving to a newer version, but he's keeping the current version uh, yes. patched. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you run updates in between in between uh, channel changes. You don't have to switch channels to update your computer. It's just that basically, it's like when a new Fedora comes out, right? Like you still get what X amount of months or whatever updating your old version, and then you have to upgrade to the to the new version. So. There is no upgrade. Wait, there's somebody. I'm just gonna say there's a. Oh. There's a Project called Snowflake. Yes. Kind of a GUI wrapper yes. over Nix that's looking to solve some of these problems. Yes. Yeah. The, out it is, but. Yeah. There is something on Snowflake OS. It uh, heavily uses Flakes, um, which again, um, I still don't kind of mess with. I'm a little more conservative <laughs> when it comes to that. But yes, it, it is promising. Um, I haven't really played with it too much though. How does Nix OS manage dependencies? So say you want to try Plasma Six. But there's things you're missing. How do you make sure that you get a complete config? Well, so you can see here when I when I next shelled in something, uh, where was it? Ah, so all I did was tell it to download Audible CLI AX. That oh yeah, okay. It will pull. Yeah. The, it, oh, that's it. Will manage the dependencies for you. That. But what's cool, um, and one of the, one of my favorite things about about Next is that when you do this rebuild, it does a sanity check on you too. So mm -hmm. for instance, if um, when I was messing around with battery settings like TLP, I had uh, my GNOME power settings mm -hmm. enabled, but I also it had TLP in there, yeah. and you can't have both of them at the same time. So instead of letting me do it and then rebooting into like this broken system, um, when I did the rebuild, it said, ah, 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 no, 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 you know, and uh, it says, you know, you can't have both. You know, there's a there's a conflict here. So um, again, if you if you do do something that like won't work. Uh, it will tell you ahead of time, which I think is really nice <laughs> to have that kind of peace of mind to be like, oh, yeah, 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 it's a little bit of a sanity check. It's the same thing with like programming languages, right? You have to compile it. Well, exactly. And like, and that will catch all kinds of errors and like waiting to, for it to fail in runtime. Yeah. Um, and then I'm sure there's situations where it won't catch something. Mm -hmm. um, but again, with generations and rollbacks, you'd, you'd be fine anyway. Yeah. But yeah. You can try again there. But yeah, yeah, yeah. If there's something obviously conflicting in there or missing, it mm -hmm. will tell you. Okay. Um, and for instance, even if you install, like if you enable Flatpak, um, but you don't, um, if you enable Flatpak in like Cinnamon, mm -hmm. you need the XGD portals thing or whatever. And again, it'll yell at you. If you have Cinnamon installed and you enable Flatpak, it says, hey, 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 you need this also set, you know, the portals equal to true. So again, it will Perfect. it will help you as much as it can. Nice.
Anyone else? 